Hey friends, welcome back to the channel. This is gonna be a bit of a rambly life update video where I share what's going on in the business, what are our goals for the year, what are the challenges that we are facing as a team, and what's going on in my personal life in terms of just updates and general challenges across the board. All right, let's start with the business side of things and let's start with our goals for the year. So we are in a new calendar year since I last did one of these updates. And so our goals, our business goals for 2022 are as follows. Basically, in terms of top line revenue, we wanna try and get to five million pounds this year. And we're aiming for a pre-tax profit of three million pounds. By the end of the year, we're hoping that maybe we'll have around 25 people in the business. And we're hoping that we'll have four million followers, subscribers, et cetera, et cetera, across all of our different domains if you add them up. So I think we'll hit that one in particular. So those are our measurables for the year. And then our goals for the year is that firstly, we wanna run three successful cohorts of our part-time YouTuber Academy. We've run one of them already, cohort five, and we have cohort six and cohort seven coming up later this year. We also wanna try and release four of our own separate courses. So one of them is already in the pipeline. A second one is being filmed in the next couple of weeks. And then two more for Q3 and Q4 of this year. We wanna have four courses released by the end of the year. And we're kind of fingers crossed hoping that we can make 100,000 pounds per month from all of those courses combined. Thirdly, we want my book to have been written. As you might know, I'm working on writing a book been spending about three and a half hours each day working on that. I'll tell you more about that further on in the video. Fourthly, we want a classy sales and marketing funnel produced for all of our courses and all, our, all of our paid products. That doesn't seem too scammy, but that actually does kind of lead people to discover our courses and our products. And finally, as a more of an internal thing, we want to have all of our core processes within the team uh, documented and followed by everyone. So those are our five main business goals and measurables that we are going after this year. And all of this is basically serving our core mission, our core purpose as, as a business, which is to help people live their best life. And right now, the way we do that is by hopefully creating inspiring and educational content along the themes of health, wealth, love, and happiness, and impact. And then overall, our kind of 10-year target is to hopefully build a profitable company that helps people while having fun. I uh, don't really care about like attaching numbers to that. Uh, I've talked before about my philosophy about goals and metrics and numbers and like to an extent, they're a necessary evil when you're running a business. But I think our 10-year goal is mostly around, can we build a profitable business that helps people while having fun um, without really overly worrying about what the numbers look like? Now, if we take this kind of five million pound figure, uh, hopefully, I mean, what we're hoping is that maybe sort of three million-ish comes from our part-time YouTuber Academy. We're hoping that one million-ish comes from the YouTube channel. And we're hoping that another one million-ish comes from our courses other than the part-time YouTuber Academy. So things like Skillshare and the courses that we are gonna produce ourselves. Within that one million in YouTube, I think hopefully about half of it will come from brand deals and sponsorships and the other half hopefully from YouTube AdSense itself. And then within our YouTuber Academy, we've got cohort five, which we've just finished. And then we have cohort six and cohort seven of the course. That's roughly what the breakdown will look like. Hopefully, we'll see. Um, again, not really overly wedded to the numbers, but like having those numbers as goals helps me and helps the team kind of make sure that we're all like, okay, cool. Like we're all on the same page. We're all kind of going in the same direction. This is what we need from a top line revenue perspective. Obviously running a business is about way more than just top line revenue, but if a business is ultimately not profitable, then it doesn't, it ceases to exist as a business. And so I think it is important to keep kind of the money side of things, the business side of things at the front of our minds, even while we are trying to do this thing of like creating inspiring educational content, because well, we have to stay solvent, we have to stay profitable. All right, next thing to talk about is the team. So currently I think we have about 19 people in the team. Now people always ask like, what does everyone in the team do? How the hell do you have 19 people in the team? And so we've been doing a whole restructure of the organization organization, uh, we've been redoing our organizational chart. And so this is currently what it looks like. So I am at the top and my role is to be the visionary for the business. We're using terminology from the book Traction by Gina Wickman, which is on the bookshelf somewhere. I uh, read it, I think last year and it was completely game changing, absolutely fantastic book. And we then have the, so we, we then have Angus who is the integrator i.e. the general manager of the business. Now the business splits into various levels and we have different people uh, which make up the leadership team. So underneath Angus, first of all, we have um, Gordon, who is our head of production. We'll talk more about these in a minute. We've got Tommy, who is our head of PTYA, our part-time YouTuber Academy. We have Becky, who is the head of the Ali Abdel brand, which feels weird to refer to myself in the third person, but cool. We have Gareth, who is the head of our new creatorpreneur brand, more on that in a little minute. And we have Dan, who is our kind of HR slash people slash finance slash admin slash legal guy who does basically all the stuff and who interfaces with our accountants and our solicitor and all that, all that fun 
from this. So the seven of us, me, Angus, Gordon, Tommy, Becky, Gareth, and Dan make up the leadership team of the business. And then each of these five people are managing various people in turn. So underneath Gordon, for example, in the production department, we currently have three editors. We have Christian, Christian, and Sean. And we're actually looking to hire another video editor and also a graphic designer. Those are open positions in the team. And in fact, if you want to check out those jobs, there'll be a link in the video description if you're based in London and you fancy joining this team as a video editor or a graphic designer. Under Tommy, under the part-time YouTuber Academy, we've got a few people. We have Bob, who is like our head of operations. We have Alison, who is our head of student success. And we have Elizabeth, who is our head of content. And we've got two open positions in the Part-Time YouTuber Academy where we're hiring more operations associates and maybe potentially looking for a data person as well. Those things will also be in that jobs page if you want to check them out for whatever reason. Then under Becky, we have lots of people. So firstly, we have Jamie, who is our YouTube channel manager slash producer. We have Amber, who is our podcast manager slash producer. We have Gwilym, who is like our chief writer. We have Ines, who is like my book research assistant. And we have Joe, who is our head of social media. So all those five people are directly reporting to Becky and Becky's job as the head of the Alibaba brand is to kind of make sure everything in the Alibaba brand, it, so, it sounds weird to say that, uh, but everything in the Alibaba brand is kind of moving forward and is kind of aligned and that is on brand and the sort of messaging is consistent and the vibe is consistent across the board. Gareth is in charge of our Creatorpreneur brand. So under him is George, who is our head of content for Creatorpreneur and Jakob, who is our head of marketing for basically everything in the business. And then Dan manages our accountants who are um, external and the lawyer from a law firm called Sheridan's, who is also external. So basically in the team overall, we have 19 slash 20 people, depending on how you count Joe, because he's technically a contractor, but he's also our head of social media. And we're actually also looking to hire three interns for the summer. So we're looking to hire a video production intern who'll be working with Gordon. We're looking to hire a writing intern who'll be working with Gwilym. And we're looking to hire another intern for our part-time YouTuber Academy. So if you're a student based in the UK, based in London, and you fancy joining our summer internship program, again, details down in the video description. So that was what the org chart looks like. And now we're gonna break down all the different aspects of the business, what they're doing and what the main challenges are before I go into my personal life. But because it is a sunny day, we are gonna go a little bit outside, take the camera off the sticks. So I'll see you in just a moment. All right, so we are in a park and what a nice day. Let's uh, talk about some of the different aspects of the business. So starting with our part-time YouTuber Academy. Now this is a thing that we started in like October of 2020. And initially it was a bit of like a, hey, we'll just see what happens. We'll see, we'll see how it goes. We'll make this course on how to be YouTubers. And initially we expected 10 people to sign up for the first cohort, but 360 people signed up for the first cohort, which was awesome. And now we've been running it five times now. We've just finished cohort five. And so far we've had over 2000 students go through the cohort. And fairly accidentally, the Part-Time YouTuber Academy has become the single biggest revenue driver in the entire business. And we've ended up in this weird position where it's like, I've been doing YouTube for five years and I've made more money teaching people how to do YouTube than by actually doing YouTube, which is actually a fairly common thing, apparently in the world of like education. You know, sometimes if you are a personal trainer, for example, and then you start coaching other personal trainers, you actually make more money coaching other personal trainers than you do actually being a personal trainer. But that's by the by. So yeah, it's become a super cool part of our business. And we've got Tommy as our head of the part-time YouTuber Academy. And underneath him, we've got Bob, Alison and Elizabeth, and we're hiring a few more people there. Yeah, it's quite, it's kind of cool. Like we've ended up with this community of people around the world who are all wanting to be YouTubers. And we've got an in-person event happening in London like next week. So we've got like, I think 50 plus people. I think we have possibly even hundred people coming over in person to hang out and do some workshops and, and things like that. And you know, one thing that I really liked about my life at university was that I got to teach people in real life. And then when I was working as a doctor, I was also a physiology supervisor at Cambridge University for Girton College. And that was super fun because I got to teach people in real life. But since pandemic and since becoming a quote full-time YouTuber, I haven't really had the chance to do much teaching in real life, but I'm really excited about the direction of the YouTuber Academy because what if we could do in-person workshops about teaching people how to use cameras and how to edit and how to be YouTubers and all of the skills associated with, with being a creator. Could we do that in person as well as online? Currently it's all online, but you know, I think there's vibes about doing it in person. And I guess one of the challenges with the part-time YouTuber Academy is to what extent we want this to actually be a major part of the business because it's, it's, it's just something, something that happened completely by accident. If I ever thought about what I want my life to look like, um, you know, a few years ago, I would, have said, I would have said I want to continue making YouTube videos, I want to continue in the field of personal development, help people live their best lives, all that kind of stuff, reading, writing, teaching. And I guess it's, it's one of those things around like where, you know, it's all well and good planning your life in advance, but then opportunities arise and stuff happens and things never really work out exactly as you planned, but sometimes things work out better than you planned. So 
Coming back to the challenge, the challenge right now is figuring out where the YouTuber Academy fits into our business overall. How much do I want to continue to be involved with it? It's really fun doing the live sessions, but there's so much work behind the scenes that's involved. The team worked ridiculously hard to put it all together. And we also need to hire more people to keep on to kind of make it happen. And in a way, the YouTuber Academy is its, its own business within our business. And partly why we have 20 people on the team is because like five of them are basically full-time supporting the part-time YouTuber Academy. So yeah, we just finished cohort five of the course. I think we did over a million dollars in revenue for this cohort. We've had really great student satisfaction ratings. We've been analyzing all the survey and the data and we have our official team debrief tomorrow for like five hours in the morning before I go to Scotland for a friend's wedding where we figure out like, you know, what, what went well, what went not so well, what can we learn? How can we improve things for next time? How can we hire more people? How can we get more student supporters on board? All of the fun stuff associated with managing the operations for such a big operation. So that is the part-time YouTuber Academy. Next up, we have the creator printer. It feels like I'm doing one of these ads, like walking up with a camera guy with a gimbal following. Anyway, we have the creator printer brand. Now, what is the deal with that? So initially, and I think I talked about this in my, in my last update video, we wanted to make a whole like part-time brand. We wanted to make like part-time podcaster, part-time YouTuber, part-time creator, part-time writer, part-time lover, you know, this whole suite of things around the kind of part-time brand. But then actually one thing that, well, one project that sort of quote failed, but that we sort of shelved this, well, in the last few months, was that we were gonna make a YouTube channel called the Part-Time Creator Academy. And in fact, we actually made a bunch of videos for it and we had the whole thing going underway. And the vision for this channel was that it was gonna be kind of like masterclass, but for creators for free on YouTube. Like, could we make the best videos in the world that teach people how to be part-time creators uh, in terms of like YouTube, podcasting, writing, drawing, et cetera, et cetera, anything associated with being a creator. But a few months into the project, like we actually released a few videos on this YouTube channel. And then we realized that, hang on, it's actually so much work <laughs> trying to create a new YouTube channel completely from scratch. You know, the vision for this channel was that I wouldn't be the only one in the videos. We'd also have Jamie and Elizabeth and Angus and Gordon and George and the rest of the team also featuring in videos and kind of like hosting certain videos. We we're going to do like creative breakdowns. And I still think this is a very good idea and we do want to do it at some point. But what we were thinking one evening, you know, me, Angus and Jamie, where we were just like hanging out in the studio and we, we were like, oh, this, this, this thing feels like a very heavy lift to this Creator Academy channel. And I just had the thought like, what if we just didn't do it? What if we just completely scrapped the idea of this Creator Academy channel? What would happen? And we've kind of just like hypothesized about what that would look like if we just completely scrapped this aspect of the business. And as I was thinking about it, I felt this enormous weight lifting off my shoulders. And, you know, similarly, everyone in the team who I mentioned this idea to afterwards, they were like, oh yeah, that's a relief. Because even though we have 20 people on the team, we were still trying to do too much. And there is always a danger when you're running a business of you know, in, the, in, in this book, the, the 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing, they call it the law of line extension, where when you're good at doing something, then you think, oh, great, we're good at doing the thing, therefore we should diversify into doing another thing and we can apply our goodness of doing one thing to the other thing. But actually there's a real danger that you wouldn't actually be good at doing the second thing. And there's a danger of like spreading yourself too thin. And so what we decided to do was completely scrap this project. Um, and therefore the part-time brand got replaced with the Creatorpreneur brand. We filmed a whole course and it's in the process of being edited called the Part-Time Creatorpreneur, which is going to be sick is basically all about how creators can think more like businesses which is all the stuff that I've learned and the team have learned over the last two three years of growing this as a proper business and then we thought you know what like what if we made like a Twitter account for the creatorpreneur where we break down but basically we do all the stuff we were going to do in the part-time creator academy YouTube channel but we do it as a Twitter account instead or as an email newsletter or as a podcast rather than as a YouTube channel, because it is such a heavy lift starting a YouTube channel because you're basically building a media company completely from scratch. Whereas Twitter, newsletter, and podcast are way lower lifts that don't necessarily require me to be the front facing, like, you know, front and center at all times, especially because my time is limited these days as I'm spending four hours a day basically writing my book. And so we're gonna be launching the Creatorpreneur brand hopefully over the next few weeks, along with the course, the, the Twitter, the newsletter, the podcast. So if you want more details about that, there'll, there'll be a link down below. But really, like, one of the things that I think about in terms of like the future of this business is how do we build stuff that doesn't rely on me as an individual? Because right now the, this YouTube channel is the foundation of the entire business. And if the YouTube channel collapses or if I get hit by a bus or if I get canceled, then the whole business basically crumbles around me and everyone is out of a job and this is not very good. Um, so can we build a brand that is tied to me, but not so intrinsically tied to me that like if something were to happen to me or if I become unavailable or if I don't want to do this stuff anymore, then then the whole business folds and crumbles. And so that was the idea behind the part-time brand and that is the idea behind this creatorpreneur brand. And so we've got Gareth leading the brand and we've got George, who was initially one of the writers uh, on our team, who's now the head of content for the creatorpreneur brand 
focusing on the Twitter and the newsletter. And so the idea is that hopefully what we'll do is, you know, each month we'll take insights from like all of our, you know, my YouTube channel, this YouTube channel, all of the other aspects of the business, the podcast, the second channel, the blog channel, and so on, to collate insights from all of our YouTuber and podcaster and creator friends. And can we turn that into actionable like articles and Twitter threads and stuff that will help people be part-time creators or become creatorpreneurs, i.e. creators that treat their thing as a business, not just as a creative side hustle. But really the idea behind it is like, can we do it in a way that it's so that's not intrinsically tied to me, where it's, it doesn't need to be in my face on camera doing all the stuff. And really, I think the way that this creatorpreneur journey goes for most people is that initially you start off as like an employee where you have no autonomy. Oh, well, you have some, some amount of auto autonomy, but very little autonomy because you're being told what to do. And then you think, oh, I want to become an entrepreneur or I want to become a creator because that will give me more autonomy. I will have the freedom to be able to just do what I want, which is currently the place I am where I do genuinely have the freedom to do what I want. But at the same time, that freedom comes with kind of golden handcuffs in a way, like shackles in that in a, in a way that yes, I do have the freedom to do what I want, but I actually don't because I quote need to film YouTube videos every week. I need to film the podcast every week. I need to keep showing up because what we don't want is for this to, to have built this business up to a point where it's ridiculously successful and then for things to stagnate. And so it almost kind of feels like running on a bit of a hamster wheel to constantly try getting the same results. Cause in a way, like, you know, I'm, uh, a lot of people who were following my YouTube channel in 2017 when I was making medical themed content, those are not the same people that are following my channel now because over the last five years, as I've grown, as people have grown, you know, if you think about the YouTubers you watch right now, possibly not the same as the YouTubers that you watched five years ago. And so there's this constant level of churn, right? Where even though the subscriber count keeps, keeps on going up, the view count doesn't necessarily because you're having to get in more subscribers to combat the churn. And so it does feel like this constant wheel of like spinning and spinning on it which is fine because it's really fun. But the thing with for the business is if we're, if we're planning for the future, what if I no longer find this fun? What if I decide that actually I don't wanna make YouTube videos every single week because I wanna focus on the book or I wanna focus on other things or I wanna spend time with my friends and family? How do we make the business more anti-fragile? How can we build a brand or brands that are not intrinsically tied to me? So the Creatorpreneur is one of them. We've also got Essentially, which is our like product line. So we've made some stationery and within that brand, we're thinking like, do we wanna make a mechanical keyboard? Do we wanna make a bag? We're working on this hourglass set. Like, can we make physical products where the brand is not like the Ali Abdullah merch store, because again, that's reliant on me, but it's, it's its own brand and I act as the sort of marketing department for that brand. Anyway, that's the theory behind all this kind of stuff. And I think that's like the next level up of creatorpreneurs. So my friend James Hoffman, I think is really good at this. So he is kind of the world's most famous coffee YouTuber, as far as I know, but he also owns his own coffee shop. He owns a coffee roasting business. He owns his own merch company, but all of those are things that are not so tied to him that he can't like have a kind of balanced, healthy family life because yeah, and so that's where we're trying to get to with this creatorpreneur brand, I hope, while at the same time actually providing a really useful service to anyone who wants to become a creator or a creatorpreneur by kind of breaking down what's worked for other people and giving all the tips, not in the format of a YouTube channel, but in the format of a Twitter account, a newsletter, and a podcast. So yeah, more details in the video description if you want to join the mailing list for whenever that is gonna be ready. All right, so that was the creatorpreneur stuff. Now let's talk about kind of the main foundation of the business, which is, quote, the Ali Abdal brand. And again, it seems weird to, to be talking about myself in the third person, like the Ali Abdal brand, but it kind of is a brand now. And that's, again, the, the thing with being a creator is that you start off as an individual, but then very quickly, if things become successful, you start to think of yourself as like a business would or as like a, a brand would kind of thing. So please forgive the weirdness and I know how it comes across, but you know, hey, you know, <laughs> I think one of the mistakes that creators make is not thinking of themselves enough as as a business and instead thinking too much as, as individuals or as creatives. But yeah, let's take a step back and think about like, what is like, what is the Ali Abdal brand like overall and, and where do I want it to go? You know, we've got a bunch of different things across a bunch of different platforms. We've got the main channel, we've got the podcast, we've got the second channel, the, vlog, the vlog channel. We have all of the social media platforms. So Twitter, LinkedIn, TikTok, Facebook, Snapchat, I'm forgetting any, Instagram. Uh, we've got the website, we've got newsletter, we've got the book that I'm writing. So that's quite a lot of stuff. And if, for example, you're a brand like, I don't know, Apple, you'll have like a marketing team who's in charge of all of the different channels of the brand and a whole brand strategy for each of the different brand channels. And that's kind of how we are starting to think about this. Like, what does this look like over the long term? And if we think of, <laughs> if we think of me as, as a brand, what is the brand strategy? for the short, medium, and long term. And so we've got Becky in charge of this now. We recently promoted Becky to kind of the head of the Ali Abdullah brand, where she'll be in charge of basically moving, quote, the brand forward. This is the thing that I, I find probably most, I most struggle with right now. Like, what is actually the point? Cool, been doing YouTube for five years, started off making content about medical school, then made content about productivity and tech, 
and now I'm sort of this life guru type figure to some people it seems and it's really fun and it's growing really nicely and it's cool and all that but like where where does it go from here honestly I'm not I'm not really sure like this is this is one of the difficulties we're having in the team whereby me as the kind of the owner of the business the CEO the visionary to use the traction terminology I need to have some kind of vision some kind of plan for where we're going and I don't, I don't really know I don't really know what I want from this I don't really know what it looks like in the future and I guess this is enough of an unusual career that there aren't that many examples of people who are doing it in a way where I can, I can point to someone and be like oh I want to be the next that person but if I were to try I think it would be a combination of Tim Ferriss, Naval Ravikant, Ryan Holiday, Cal Newport and like Derek Sivers if any of those names mean anything to you. Those are the sort of people who I have in my mind as like, you know, if I could do some kind of combination of what they're doing, then that would be awesome. I think overall, what I want to do is basically spend my time reading, writing, and teaching. And I kind of want to have the freedom to learn and teach stuff on my own terms. So what does that look like? I think what that looks like is that in the future, I want to, like, I'm, I'm just really interested in personal development, and I suspect always will be, really interested in like evidence-based stuff, because medical background and all that stuff. I like figuring out how we can optimize our lives for the better. And given that that's the stuff I'm interested in, given that I'm also like very interested in teaching, I like teaching that kind of stuff to other people. Not so much in a sense of being a guru, like I know the answers, but more in the sense of like, hey, let's all figure this out together. And here's a paper that I read that talked about procrastination. And here's a technique that you can use from that thing that I found particularly helpful, that, that kind of stuff. And I think I'd like to do that for the long term. Obviously, I reserve the right to change my mind if new, if, you, if new data or new preferences should arise. But that's the direct, kind of the direction I want to go. For example, Tim Ferriss is great because he, in, his brand was initially all about like productivity, but then he expanded into like health and like wellness and general life stuff. And then he started his podcast and brought other people on board. And now he's released more books about that. And now he's going into the psychedelic stuff and like the mental health stuff. So he's like, his career has kind of gone sort of exponentially bigger over time. But also he seems to be following his interests and focusing on the things that he's enjoying rather than being tied to being the four hour guy or the productivity guy. Um, so that's pretty cool. I think Ryan Holiday's career as a book author is interesting because of his lifestyle. He spends four hours a day working, you know, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m., uh, lives on a farm near, near Austin, Texas, apparently. And yeah, just does reading and writing in the mornings and then spends the afternoon and the evening just hanging out with his family and taking his kids to school and going for a walk in the park and seems to have a really solid balanced life. But at the same time, with that, what looks like a four hour workday, he's also producing prolific output and writes a new book every two years or so. It always hits a New York Times bestseller list. It's always really good. And he's really bringing stoicism to the masses, as it were. And genuinely, the people that read his books, including me, have like, they've, they've profoundly impacted me because they've taught me about Stoicism, this school of ancient Greek philosophy that I wouldn't necessarily have come across otherwise. So that's really cool in terms of like a life setup. Someone like Cal Newport is interesting. Again, has the straddles this world of being a teacher because he's a professor, I think at Caltech or something like that in computer science. And so he does real life teaching, which I think is really cool. But he also writes blogs and books and podcasts and, and has a YouTube channel now recently. And that kind of life seems kind of interesting. Someone like Derek Sivers, ditto, sort of thought leader-esque, was an entrepreneur, sold his company and then writes philosophically about life. And similarly, Naval Ravikant, angel investor, founder of AngelList, but really, you know, famous to me for being like a, just a deep thinker and a bit of a philosopher and like thinks interesting things about life and his wisdom and stuff, I think really applies to my own life and applies to the lives of millions of other people and helps us live better lives. So if I could do some sort of amalgamation of what all these guys are doing, where I can try my best to live my own best life and to be kind of on this journey of personal development and stuff. And as I discover cool stuff, I can make videos about it. I can write about it, I can write books about it maybe and I can teach it to other people kind of as a documentarian. So I become kind of like the guinea pig for trying these new things out and then sharing them with other people. That's, I think, what I want from, quote, my brand. And most of the stuff that I care about is the content and the teaching side of it. Like I love the reading and I love the writing and I love the making of videos. What I don't love so much is the logistics, is the thinking about the data. It's like, oh, what's the title of this video gonna be? I don't know, what's the thumbnail for this video gonna be? Don't really know, don't really care. How do we title our podcast in a way that gets the most clicks? Because actually the title mat matters a huge, huge amount. How do we look at the analytics to see where the retention was falling off and, and stuff? It's those things which are really important in building a kind of media brand but those things that I'm not very good at personally or I'm just not massively interested in. And so that's really where the team comes in. Like Jamie is our YouTube producer, or Amber is our podcast producer, or Becky is, our, is like the brand manager. The team can figure those details out and they can feed back to me, be like, hey, Ali, people don't like it when you ramble, so maybe avoid rambling so much. I'm like, okay, cool, noted, that's fine. But I don't have to be in the weeds digging through the data and being like, oh my God, how did that video perform? And what I found is like, the more I can dissociate myself personally from the numbers, like I'm not really gonna look at how many views this video gets. I don't really care how many views this video gets. That's Jamie's job to 
look at it and be like, hey, this video didn't do too well because of ABCDE, let's improve that for next time. And that's awesome, that's fantastic. We're on this constant source of, source of improvement. But it's nice for me not to have to worry about those details. And I think that's another place that, you know, obviously starting out for two years as a solo creator, I had to do all that kind of stuff myself all the video editing, all the camera setup, all the lighting, all the data analytics, all of it was all coming from me. But now that we've got a team, I can lean on other people who are better at those sorts of things. Like we've got people in the team who are sick at data, whereas I don't really care about data myself. And so this is the great part of getting to this level of creditpreneur where you can like leverage other people's skills. Gordon, the cameraman, is way better at cameras than I will ever be. Uh, and so <laughs> like it's perfect because I can fully trust that Gordon will deal with making stuff look pretty so I don't then have to think about it. And I can focus my energies on how do I make the best content possible and how do I teach in the most effective way possible, which is the thing that I personally care about. So coming back to the Ali Abdal brand, what are the different facets of it? So we've got YouTube, which is managed by Jamie, our YouTube manager slash producer. We've got the Deep Dive podcast, which I think is like really fun uh, and interesting. And it started a few months ago and we're already on like, I don't know, 75,000 subscribers on the YouTube channel and several tens of thousands of downloads per episode, which is awesome. But again, I don't really care about the numbers myself. It's just sort of conversations that I have with inspiring people, authors, entrepreneurs, creators about how they got to where they are and like the strategies and tools that we can use uh, on our shared journey of living, living our best lives. So the podcast is really fun for me, especially because I don't have to deal with the logistics. Initially, I think it was like this time last year where Angus, I think it was, Angus and our friend Hassan had the idea that, hey, we should start a podcast. And immediately I was like, oh, but that's such a faff. Like I already felt like I didn't have enough time in my life. The thought of emailing people and booking guests and dealing with logistics and calendars and cameras and, and all that stuff just made me think, oh, this is not gonna be fun. But then what Angus said was, what if you didn't have to do any of that? What if the team just took care of everything and all you had to do was rock up and have a conversation with someone? I was like, oh, all of a sudden that sounds really fun. And that is now basically the setup we've got for the podcast where I rock up once a week or so, have a conversation with someone cool. I spend some time preparing for that conversation. And obviously I know who the guests are because I, you know, we have this little whole database of people that we're, that we're reaching out to. But Amber deals with all the logistics. Gordon and Sean deal with the camera setup. Gordon, and Sean and Christian deal with all the editing. Amber deals with all the analytics. Like all of that non, <laughs> the, the bits that are less interesting for me are the bits that I don't have to deal with, which is why for me, the podcast is super fun and it's been super useful for people. We've had some really good feedback on a mid season survey and we've just finished two seasons of it and we're gonna be starting season three in the next few weeks. So if you haven't yet checked out the podcast, you might like to check it out. I'll put a link down below if you wanna see that. In other exciting news, we are also starting a daily vlog. <laughs> yes, this is a thing, you know, <laughs> I know I talked about how we're doing too much, but I think the daily vlog is a bit of a 30 day experiment to see what happens. But we have a vlog channel. It's called Ali Abdal Vlogs. It used to be called Ali's Appendix and then it became Ali Abdal Behind the Scenes and the name changed and like, still not massively sold on Ali Abdal Vlogs. Maybe we'll go back to Ali's Appendix. Let me know what you think in the comments. But it is a second channel where like this channel is other than videos like this one, usually where I sit down and I present something that, hey, here is a strategy that you can use to be more productive or here is a framework for better skincare or here's a framework for better longevity or health and stuff. Whereas on the second channel, on the vlog channel, it's more like, kind of day in the life stuff. Kind of the inspirations here are some people like Gary Vaynerchuk and Stephen Bartlett, who do a good job of documenting the things that they are doing as entrepreneurs, as creators, as business people. And I think there's something really cool about that. Like, I really wish these people I mentioned, Tim Ferriss, Cal Newport, Ryan Holiday, Derek Sivers, Naval, I really wish these people had vlogs where you just could, could get a bit of an insight into what they were actually doing day to day, but they tend not to do that kind of thing for whatever reason, maybe because it's too much effort, maybe because they just don't want to do it. But I think that would be really cool if, um, yeah, basically I can document my life. And if it's useful for some people, then you know, that, that could be interesting. Uh, we've had a few comments on the vlog being like, hey, this, this kind of stuff is more interesting than the main channel content. Because the main channel content like can get a bit tiring after a while if it's just like kind of, the same self-improvement advice again and again and again. Whereas a lot of people in the audience are like, oh, we actually prefer the vlogs because it's a bit more raw, it's a bit more relatable, it's a bit more honest, all that, all that kind of stuff. And it's just been really fun doing the vlog. So we've done it for the last three days so far and we're planning to do it for the next 30 days as a bit of an experiment to see what happens. And if it goes well, and if it's enjoyable, and if it's fun and we think it's, it's useful, then we'll continue doing the daily vlog. And I do like the idea of daily vlogging my life for the foreseeable future. So that is what we're doing with the vlog channel. Again, if you haven't checked those out, that'll be linked down below if you wanna, if you wanna see. Next, we have our social media stuff. So we've got Joe in charge of social media on like Twitter and Instagram and LinkedIn and TikTok. Previously, what we did with social media was that it was very kind of repurposed. Like we would film a YouTube video for the main channel and then we'd chop bits out of that video and we'd post them on Instagram or on Twitter or chop bits out of a podcast and post them. And we still do that to an extent, but not very much. I think the way that I wanna start thinking of this is that like, treating each of the social platforms as like its own thing. If I'm doing a video about productivity tips on YouTube and it's like a 20 minute long video that explores like 10 different things, 
can we turn those things into 10 different TikToks where the content that we create is actually native to the platform itself? So it's not like we're copying and pasting the same video on YouTube and just chucking on TikTok, but in fact, we are creating 10 separate TikToks where I'm giving 10 different productivity tips in a way that works on TikTok and that works for that audience. Can we turn that video into a thread on Twitter or into like a graphical image or something like that, which is easier to share and absorb for the people that are on Twitter primarily rather than on YouTube? Can we turn it into an Instagram carousel, which is nice and easy to consume on Instagram? Can we turn it into a LinkedIn post, which is easy for people to consume on LinkedIn? And really, it's moving away from thinking of myself as I'm a YouTuber and then I repurpose stuff and put it on other platforms and more towards, again, this sounds a bit like cringe, but I'm trying to be, I guess, a thought leader or like a teacher. I think teacher is the right word. I'm trying to be a teacher. And the thing that I want to teach is like the message, but the message can take different forms depending on what platform it's for. Like a message on TikTok is very different to a message on a two hour long podcast. And the same message is very different on a Twitter thread or on a YouTube video. And so how can we think about message first and idea first and then platform second? And then how can we use the team to kind of, who have expertise in each of the different platforms to basically figure out the best way of delivering that message for the different platforms. So that's what we're doing on the social front. Uh, similarly, website, blog posts and stuff. We've kind of been neglecting the website a little bit. It's not a huge priority right now, but maybe that's something that we'll hire for, like a website manager or something like that. And then finally, we come to the book. Now, the book is the major project that I've been working on uh, for the last kind of year or so. We now have a new editor on the team. Her name is Rachel and she's fantastic. And we have our two editors from Penguin and Macmillan, Rowan and Ryan who are great as well and very involved in the process. We've got my agent, Kate, from Peter Fraser Dunlop, a literary agency based here in London. And on our team, we have Inez and we have Jack, who are kind of like our book research assistants who are helping kind of make sure that the stuff that we're putting in the book is evidence-based and is legit and has like genuine science-backed research behind it, which is awesome. And so, yeah, the book is making progress. I uh, can't reveal too many details about it right now, but yeah, I've been spending basically every day, 9 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. That's like my book writing time. Uh, we've nailed the concept. I think we've got a title that we're happy with. And now we're just trying to figure out like, what are the chapter outlines looking like? And we are hoping tentatively, I'm gonna say this now, tentatively, can we get a first draft by the end of July? And the final quote deadline is the end of this calendar year. So around December. And hopefully, fingers crossed, the book will come out in January of 2024 because it takes ages for, you know, traditional publishing to spin its wheels and for things to actually come out. That's pretty exciting. Working on the book has been really fun. Earlier today, I was reading a paper about procrastination from Pierre Steele, who is a, re a researcher from C Calgary University in procrastination. And it was, it was, it's really cool. It's really cool going back to like the scientific roots of like my life and reading papers again and highlighting stuff and like having a note-taking system. And it, it feels like almost being back at university where I'm working on this research question of like, how do we be more kind of sustainably, sustainably productive in, in a nice way? And how do we tie in all the research that people have done over the decades, over the years, in terms of like psychology and neuroscience and behavioral economics and all that fun stuff. And how do we turn it into a book that, that has interesting stories and interesting anecdotes and bits from my own life, but also bits from scientific studies and is packaged in a way that is compelling and accessible for people to read. So that's a really fun project to be working on. And I can definitely see myself wanting to write more books after this, but that is the thing that's taking up the bulk of my time. Final thing to talk about in the Alibaba brand is that we are actually taking our community more seriously. So we actually have a Discord server called The Friend Zone, where, link down below if you want to join, it's completely free, where we're going to be doing more community stuff, stuff like live kind of Zoom uh, co-working sessions for when I'm writing my book. I kind of did those a bit during lockdown. They were very popular. I want to re resurrect those. And we want to get like the community involved and have been in terms of like giving content suggestions and thumbnail ideas and that kind of stuff. But also people seem to be forming their own little community on that Discord server, which is nice. It's pretty active. People talk about tech, about studying, about productivity, about like rating setups. Uh, it's pretty cool. I browse through it occasionally. I'm not there all the time because I'm focusing on actually trying to work. But if you would like to join the friend zone community, completely free, it's always going to be free. Um, there'll be a link down below to the Discord server. All right, let's talk about a few challenges. I'm going to walk, oh, let's walk in that direction. Let's talk about a few challenges um, in the business now. We've already talked about the challenge of like, what does this look like in the short term, medium term, long term? It's a pretty uncertain future. Businesses like this are not massively, well, there's not a lot of them. And so we don't really have a playbook to follow, but it's just like, we're doing our best. But there is this, like when you have a team of 20 people, there is this balance between like experimentation and stability. And I think as a solo entrepreneur, as a solo creator, maybe even with a team of two or three people, it's very easy to move fast and just be like, all right, cool. This thing sounds cool. Let's do the thing. Whereas when you have a team of 20 people, this level of like, I'm very kind of mind changey and like oh, my mind's always going in a, a dozen different directions. It's very easy for that to become really annoying for the team who need a little bit of stability in their lives to actually do their best work. And so what we're trying to figure out is what is the best setup for this? How do we retain our flexibility? How do we retain our kind of experimentation, the kind of attitude 
but while also adding a little element of stability for the team. And one thing that we're thinking of right now is can we make a roadmap or something for the next year or two where the next three, where the next three months is very like set in stone and we're like, we know what's happening over the next three months, but where six months, nine months, 12 months is fuzzier. So we have a bit of a rough outline of what might happen in the business around that time, but it's not the sort of thing that is so set in stone that we can't change things if we need to, if new data comes to light or we have a new idea and things like that. I think another challenge is more of a personal one is kind of figuring out what do I want my own life set up to look like? And then how does that relate to the business? So for example, one thing I've been toying with the, uh, the idea of for ages is the idea of traveling the world. I wanted to do that in 2020, but then lockdown happened just after I quit my job as a doctor. And so I couldn't do that. And now we've got the studio in London and stuff. But if I do want to travel around the world for ex an extended period of time, what does that mean for the team? What does that mean for the studio? What does that mean for the business overall? Right now, we're a fairly hybrid team. We've got, I think, three people who are remote right now, but everyone else is hybrid and in person in London quite a lot of the time. Do we want to continue to build a hybrid team? Do we want to go fully remote? Do we want to go fully in person? What's that process going to look like? And how does it relate to yeah, basically I need to figure out what I want to do with my life and then therefore the business kind of ideas will follow. But hopefully if we can make these extra brands, Creatorpreneur, essentially the product line, any future brands that we create, if we can make those successful, then it means that my own kind of life setup gets dissociated from what's actually happening in the business. And then maybe like the whole business doesn't need to uproot itself if I decided that if I decide I want to live in a different country, for example. Kind of another random thing is like, what do we do with our studio? Our, our lease is expiring in October and I don't think we're going to renew it. I don't think we want to keep this place, even though it's very nice. It's just stupidly expensive. And we've realized that what we actually need is a separate room for YouTube videos, a separate room for podcasts so we can have multiple sets and we can have things set up at all times just to reduce the friction. And so what we're thinking about is can we rent as a business, like a three or four bedroom apartment, make one bedroom the YouTube studio, one bedroom the podcast, studio one bedroom maybe YouTube set number two and another bedroom maybe like a spare guest bedroom for any time team members who live slightly further away are coming to visit London can we just make our own little hotel as well where people can just live there if they want to uh, that would be pretty cool that's kind of where I'm leaning towards right now and so we're in the process of trying to look for some kind of space if anyone is watching this and you have you are or you know someone who's an estate agent or someone who manages property and stuff we would love to rent an absolutely sick place three or four bedroom apartment or house or something preferably in central london please do get in touch ali at aliabdal.com and we'll see yeah it would be kind of cool if we can if we can work something out because right now we're just looking on like websites and right move and, and things like that so maybe maybe there's something interesting there and finally i guess let's talk about personal life updates a little bit and so in terms of the personal life again i like to split things up into health wealth love and happiness and i just want to talk about each of these a little bit in turn for anyone who's still interested in terms of health i think that's actually going pretty well me and gordon my videographer and gym buddy have been doing a regular workout regimen where we're working out three times a week Still not taking my diet overly seriously, but I am kind of thinking when I do order a takeaway, how can I order a healthier takeaway rather than an unhealthy takeaway? Kind of dabbling a little bit with cooking. I've been hosting a few dinner parties where I cook in the dinner parties. Still not, definitely not cooking regularly at all, but it is, yeah, it is a thing that I've been dabbling with. And generally I'm pretty happy with how the health stuff is going. Did a badminton session earlier today along with a gym session and I feel really good now that I did some exercise and activity during the day and that feels awesome. Uh, so I wanna incorporate sports, badminton and squash are my jams in particular a little bit more, but that's happening on a, on a health front. And I do definitely wanna make more, make health more of a priority in my life. I'll talk more about that in just a moment. Let's move on to the wealth side. So we've already talked all about the career stuff, um, you know, investments, stock and share portfolio, real estate, crypto, all of that stuff going reasonably well, working with a kind of wealth slash financial advisor now, which is kind of weird and cool and interesting. Um, never thought I would get into <laughs> that position, but, but here we are. The love thing is interesting. So within love, I would put like friendships and relationships. In terms of relationships, um, as you might've heard from a previous podcast episode, I now have a girlfriend who have been going strong for about eight months now. And that's, that's really fun. It's going, yeah, it's nice. Uh, more details to come about that at some point. And then on the friendship front, I think I still do a bad job of keeping in touch with friends. And so one thing that I wanna make more of a priority in my life is for example, hosting dinner parties and just having people over. And there was a really, really good article I read on the Harvard Business Review, which was an article written in 2010 by Clayton Christensen, who is a Harvard Business School professor, and it's called, How Will You Measure Your Life? And one really interesting thing he says in that article is that like, when, when this chap was at university, he spent an hour every day, kind of, he's big on the Christianity stuff, so like reading the Bible and trying to figure out his purpose in life. And the, there was a line in this article where he said that like, when, when you have a spare hour in your day, what is the thing that you default to? 
Now for me, when I have a spare hour in my day, the thing that I default to is something work related. I think, oh, I can work on, work on the book for an extra hour or work on the YouTube video for an extra hour or plan this video out better so it's a bit less rambly and less all over the place and less long. But one thing that, but like what, what he argues in the article is that like, you know, when you think about how you'll measure your life, Mo like if we, if we think about regrets of people who are on, the, on on their deathbed, they all basically say, I wish I hadn't worked so hard. And so when I have a spare hour of my day, why is work the thing that I default to? What if instead the thing that I defaulted to was something to do with health or relationships? And I've been trying this new model out for the last last couple of weeks. And it's actually been really good. It's like, I have a spare, I have a spare hour. I'm like, oh, cool. Let me organize some kind of brunch where I can invite all my friends. Great. That's done in half an hour. And now my friends are coming over for brunch, like quite a lot of friends, in a thing that wouldn't have happened if I'd spent that hour working on the book. Or if I have a spare half an hour, I think, okay, is there something I can do for my health? Maybe I'll just go for a walk. Maybe I'll go to the gym for a quick session. Half an hour is better than nothing. And thinking in those terms of like, what is, the, what is my default use of time? And how can I make sure that the default use of my time is something that is actually contributing towards my overall life satisfaction, rather than the default, which is to just keep on working. Because to be honest, for me, and for people like me, work will take care of itself. Like, I don't need to struggle to motivate myself to work because work because the work is really fun. I really enjoy it, but I do then run the risk of letting the other more and more important areas of my life, like health and relationships and happiness, uh, kind of take a back seat. And so I guess for me, it's about kind of refiguring out this balance, whatever that looks like. And finally, in terms of happiness, honestly, I can't imagine being much happier than I am right now, but I've kind of been saying that for years. I think I'm very lucky in that I don't really have any mental health issues, and I believe in all the stoicism type stuff and. I think I'm just generally prone to being very, fairly zen and fairly happy and not particularly anxious about stuff. In fairness, also I've lived a very privileged life where I haven't really had any adverse circumstances. So maybe something will come that completely kicks me in the teeth and that, yeah, is really bad for my mental health. But right now things are going really well. And yeah, one thing I often ask myself is like, what is the difference between the life I would wanna have if I won the lottery and the life that I have right now? Like, what, what would my calendar look like if I didn't need to worry about making money? And broadly, it's actually fairly similar to what it looks like now. I think I'd broadly be kind of doing the same things, like reading, writing, teaching. I'd still be making YouTube videos, I'd still be doing podcast episodes. Maybe I wouldn't be doing, like, paid courses. I'd probably just make them free. But other than that, everything else about my life would stay broadly the same. And I think I, I do like to check in with myself and look at my calendar and be like, is, is there anything in the calendar this week that I haven't enjoyed doing? and then I figure out a way to delegate it or eliminate it in some capacity. So that's been super nice. And that's one of the really nice parts about being a creatorpreneur or being an entrepreneur of any kind where you actually can just do that. Uh, you can decide what life setup you want for yourself and you can take the steps to make it happen. Whereas in a previous life when I was working as a doctor and I had my schedule controlled by my rotor coordinator, a lot of things in my life were outside of my control. And so I guess the final thing I'd like to say in this video is just a massive thank you. Like because of you, because of you guys, because of this YouTube channel, my life has completely transformed over the last five years. The stuff I'm doing now, the people I'm meeting, the friends I'm making, like it's, it's just stuff that I would never have dreamed even possible. And it's all come as a result of like me making these silly internet videos and you guys continuing to watch them. So yeah, massive thank you for your support on that front. Um, that brings us to the end of this video. If, you're, if you like this and you got this far, I would love it if you can leave a clover emoji as usual. No idea how long this video is gonna be, probably ridiculously long. And if you haven't seen last quarters, like six months ago, the update, the life update, do click on that video over there because that is, you know, if you're interested, uh, were my, my exact thoughts, but exa exactly about six months ago uh, when we first moved into the studio and I first moved to London. So you can see how things have changed and maybe some, something in this video has been helpful to you. But either way, thank you so much for watching. Hit the subscribe button if you aren't already and I'll see you hopefully in the next video. Bye-bye.